Good morning, it is the 9th of August 2023 and welcome to this cancer update. Today is round two, day 14 of uh, my chemo journey. And because of that, I thought I would um, do a bit of comparison between how round one went and round two went. But before we get onto that, we obviously have to address several elephants in the room. So firstly is my shirt. Um, no real significance to this other than I saw it online and thought it was really cool. Um, I really like the, the machine, the man machine or the, fem, the woman machine interface in this case of it. And um, I like the oriental uh, references and I just thought it looked really cool. So I bought it. Uh, the other things to talk about, uh, I think I've introduced some of the uh, plushies in the house before, but um, just let me say that the arrangement of the animals today is very strategic. I've put Rupert right next to me because Rupert famously is a very quiet bear, um, actually is mute, um, does, doesn't say a word actually. And um, I thought it would be quite wise to have Rupert right next to me. Um, behind Rupert, we've got Lamb. Lamb speaks one word and that word is Lamb. So um, I thought I could probably handle that, but um, this, this teddy bear here in the blue overalls, that is Ted, and Ted is on the other side of me for very important reasons, and that is, on his own, really quiet bear. Whenever Caroline's around, potty mouth. And I don't trust that bear, so that bear needs to be on the other side, all right? Okay, let's get on with our day. So comparing um, round one with round two, I'll just pop, um, pop some stuff up on the screen for you, which unfortunately is gonna wipe out the plushies for a little while, but there we go. Uh, the first thing about uh, the way this has gone is my better nutrition. So this time around, I had Caroline um, cooking some really nutritious food for me. Uh, we had a good balance of proteins, which in particular were beef, pork, chicken, and cashew nuts with carbohydrates, which were rice and potatoes mainly. We did have a little bit of pasta as well. And some good fats. So we had avocado and, um, and olive oil in particular. So we had a really good um, balanced diet there of all the macronutrients of um, protein, carbohydrate and fat. The second thing was less tumour load. So at the start of round one, my CA199 score was 3,193, uh, that's units per milliliter. And at the end of round two, it was 2,798. So I literally had less tumor inside my body and that obviously made it, made it easier um, for me to get by. So, so that was really good. The third thing on the list there is less anxiety. So this time round, I knew what to expect. Um, Round one was an unknown, so of course I had a bit of anxiety. So round two, I simply, I had a bit more of an idea of what to expect. I knew that days three, four, and five would be tough, uh, and they were, but they were, as they turned out, they were less tough than, um, than round one. And I wanna point out that in round one, if you remember, I did actually manage to pull the engine out of a, out of a Mazda chassis. So even in round one, there were good days, there were some absolutely good days, um, but certainly days three, four, and five were not good days, but there were others that were. So if you're watching this video because you're about to head into um, a, a chemo situation, what I would say to you is what my chemo oncologist said to me, which is there will be good days and there will be bad days, but there will be more good days than bad days, okay? That, that certainly was my experience on Folfox 6, um, I should hasten to add that please speak to your specific um, chemo oncologist because you may or may not be on the same um, drugs as me. You may or may not be the same age or gender or many other specifics. But um, certainly for me, I was told to expect more good days than bad days. And that has been what has happened. And in particular, the, the, the tricky days are days three, four, five. Uh, less ascites. So during round one, I started with 10 litres of ascites and I ended with five. And the way I've calculated that is I know that I had six litres removed during round one, and I'm assuming that I put on one litre of ascites. 
So 10 minus 6 plus 1 is 5. That's how I've done the math mathematics there. And this time round, um, in round 2, I started with 5 litres and I ended with 1.5 litres. So I know that I had 4.5 litres removed um, uh, a few days ago. So 5 minus 4.5 plus 1 um, is 1.5 litres. So that's how I've calculated that as well. So now that we're talking about ascites, I get a few questions uh, asking basically what is ascites? And I must admit, when I got that um, CT scan that said um, uh, incidental finding large ascites, I didn't know what the word ascites was. And I've got a really, really good vocabulary and I'd never heard of it. Now, that tells me that um, a lot of people probably don't know what ascites is. So I'll just pop up on the screen here uh, an image and I'll probably push myself off to the side just to give myself room to pop this image up. That's what ascites is. So you can see in the healthy body, there's your peritoneum uh, or your peritoneal cavity is what they call it in this, in this graphic. And you can see all of your peritoneal organs are sitting in there. So you've got a liver, a stomach, um, the transverse colon, the small intestines. There's also um, your, your stomach, pancreas, spleen, uh, gallbladder, um, what else have I, kidneys are in there, um, bladder, uterus, um, ovaries. There's a whole bunch of things that are in there. So you can see what it looks like in a healthy adult or healthy child as well, by the way. And you can see in a diseased um, person that it just, it just loads up with fluid. And you'll know from some of my old videos that that profile uh, is exactly what I looked like. And um, that's what was going on inside my body. I was basically just full of ascites. So I've, I've been having that drained um, every two to three weeks. The drainage journal is in the description to this video, by the way, and in the description to every single video, uh, every cancer video before this. So if you wanna keep a track of my drainage journal, I do post it on every single, in every single video. So that's what ascites is. It's basically your body's inflammation response to cancer. So if you've got cancer somewhere in your peritoneum, then uh, you, will, you will get infl inflammation and that inflammation will, will generate ascites. And um, uh, for me, that was the marker that put me onto the um, trail that, that I had cancer. So for those of you that haven't watched Cancer Update 16, the very brief story is I had back pain. I went and got a CT scan for my back pain and they said, well, here's the story with his back, but I wouldn't worry so much about his back because incidentally, this guy has large ascites. Go and work that out first. And um, of course, what they were saying is, don't worry about his back pain, this guy's got cancer. And um, as we went on, we found that um, I had um, pseudomyxoma peritoni from an appendiceal um, primary, but I'll talk more about that in a second. So let's go on to the next slide. Uh, we've talked about the things that I had less of, Let's talk about the things that I, that I um, have had more of. So I've had more steroids. So last time I had dexamethasone injections only, or an injection, that's one injection only. That was at the time, that's on day one, basically, of the chemo cycle. This time, being round two, I had the injection and I had one dexamethasone um, tablet for each of days two and three. So basically this time round I had two extra tablets, one each on days two and three. And from what I can tell, they helped. So um, I will certainly be asking to continue on that regimen of having a tablet on uh, days two and three. The second thing on this list is more nausea, nausea medication. Excuse me. Um, so in round one, I had metoclopramide only for round two, um, I've also had um, ondansetron, which is otherwise known as Zofran. So, um, so that's a good thing. Thirdly, I had more pain medication. So during round one, I was on five micrograms per hour of buprenorphine. This time around, I'm on 10 micrograms per hour. So that's that patch there, which is looking quite old now. It's um, it's a seven day patch and um, today, today is day six. So this thing comes up tomorrow. That's why it's looking a bit ratty. Um, but that is putting out 10 micrograms per hour of buprenorphine. 
And the fourth thing on the list is more company. So during round one, I was on my own a fair bit. And for all of round two, I've had Caroline with me. Now, Caroline's at work right now. That's why I'm at home alone. But um, I, I do have her uh, with me first thing in the morning and at night and all through the weekends. And um, Caroline's started a new job. So once that job has settled in, she'll be able to do some working from home. And, um, and that'll be lovely when she's able to work from home because um, I'll, be, I'll be able to uh, uh, have her around uh, on weekdays. So that, that'll be really nice. And uh, look, I probably can't underestimate, uh, sorry, probably can't overestimate how, um, how much it has helped to have Caroline around. It's, uh, I had friends coming to visit me during round one, but on most nights I was, I was sleeping in the house on my own and it, um, you, you, you're alone with your thoughts and it's sometimes nice just to have someone to, to chat to. And I, and I do want to point out, you guys have been great. Uh, you've, you've commented a lot. You've, um, uh, you, you've said really, really kind words to me and you absolutely have helped. Um, and I do thank you for that. Um, however, having Caroline physically here um, has has um, has multiplied that effect um, quite quite a bit, so that's been good. I thought I'd also give you um, a definition, or at least some kind of bit more background on what pseudomyxoma peritoneal is. It is a one in a million cancer. If you want a really really good pub quiz question, then here it is. Uh, what did Audrey Hepburn die of? The answer is, she died of pseudomyxoma peritoneal from an appendiceal um, primary, which is exactly what I've got. So Audrey Hepburn um, passed away uh, from, from the very disease that I have. It's got an incidence rate of one in a million, uh, but um, as, you can, as you can see, at least one famous person has actually passed away from it. So I'm um, just putting this graphic up and I'll sit back a little bit just to make sure I've got enough room for the graphic to fit on the screen. Uh, what is pseudomyxoma peritoneal? Pseudomyxoma peritoneal, otherwise known as PMP, is a rare cancer, is a rare tumour that grows slowly and causes a build-up of mucin, which is a jelly-like substance, in the abdomen and pelvis, giving rise to the name jelly belly. PMP often starts in the appendix, but can also start in other organs such as the large bowel and ovary. While it doesn't spread to other parts of the body, PMP can put pressure on important organs as it continues to grow and this may cause problems. PMP is rare. It is more likely to be diagnosed in people aged 40 years and over. Women may be diagnosed slightly more often and at an earlier stage than men after a mass or lump is found in the ovary. So um, women are slightly more overrepresented in this disease than men because obviously women have ovaries and men don't. And um, an ovarian uh, tumour is one way that um, PMP kicks off. I just want to come back to that second paragraph where they said it, it doesn't spread to other parts of the body. Um, that, is that is a true statement, but um, it hides um, quite, a, quite an evil truth. It doesn't spread to other parts of the body, but it does completely spread through the peritoneum. So uh, if I go to the next graphic, that is the, a graphic of a tumour on an appendix. So that's what happened in my case. I just got a little tumour on my appendix. Uh, it's completely painless. You, you don't feel a thing. And the really weird thing is it's a cancer that the organ cures itself of. Unfortunately, the way that the appendix cures itself of appendiceal cancer is by spitting it out. And, and what that means is afterwards, the appendix is actually perfectly healthy. Unfortunately, it has completely sprayed everything that's in the same bag as it with tumour. So in my peritoneal cavity right now, I have tumours and I know because my PCI score, which is peritoneal cancer index score is 39, that my tumours are two point two and a half centimetres or larger on every single organ in my peritoneum. So I have tumours on my liver, gallbladder, stomach, um, uh, pancreas, spleen, both kidneys, large intestine, small intestine, bladder, everything. Everything in my um, peritoneal cavity is covered in tumours uh, that started out as tiny little tumours on my appendix 
that my appendix one day just said, I'm going to spit that everywhere. And uh, that's quite unfortunate, but that's what happened to me. So, um, yeah, sucks to be me, huh? Anyway, so that's what's ha what happened in my case. So just coming back to that, um, that, that graphic for the pseudomyxoma peritoneum, Yes, it doesn't spread to other parts of the body, so it's not going to end up in my uh, my heart or my lungs or my brain. It has, however, spread it completely through my peritoneum. And um, things like liver cancer and pancreas cancer, um, if I get fully blown cancer of um, the liver or the pancreas, that kills and it kills fast, thankfully fast, to be honest. Uh, more commonly is that you get cancer of the large intestine or, or bowel cancer. Um, that kills but kills slowly and, and stands a much better chance of, of um, things like resection where they, they can cut out the disease parts and what have you. But um, let's not lose sight of the fact that, that my entire abdomen is full of tumour and um, I'm fighting a real battle here. And, that, and that's why the, the specialists are saying to me, I, I, need a, I need a miracle to get out of this. Uh, we fight the fight, right? we fight the fight and all of us are going to die none of us get out of here alive and uh and i have led a really good life i've um i've made it to 52 i'm turning 53 in september so um i'm pretty i'm very confident i'll make it to 53 not so confident i'll make it to 54 but um let's uh let's say i make it to 53 i've done more in 53 years than a lot of people do in 103 years so um i am actually okay with it I, i'm i'm getting i'm getting Close, closer and closer to acceptance. And on that topic, you'd remember I was seeing a, um, a psychologist. I contacted the psychologist the other day and I said, um, I'm, I'm good now, we can stop these sessions because I, I've, I've, I feel like I've achieved what I wanted to achieve, which is I now feel like I am facing death um, maturely and with acceptance. I think I went in there saying I wanted to face it bravely. Um, I, that might have been a bit of a naive statement on my part, um, a, a bit of bit of bravado or, or what have you, thinking that you would bravely face death. Um, I had some I had some people comments, um, and by people I'm, in this case I mean um, medical staff that work with palliative people, and they said um, they indicated to me that death, no, no one they've ever seen in the throes of death, would say they are they are brave. What they would say is they are accepting. And um, that was a real education for me. Um, it took away my naivety. I thought I wanted to be brave in death. Now I realise I need to be accepting in death. And uh, I feel like I'm getting there. I don't want to die today. I don't want to die tomorrow. And I don't even want to die in the next year. Um, but, but the statistics are stacked against me. And, and like I said, everyone dies. I am going to die. The only question is whether I die short term, medium term, or long term. Um, so I am coming to I am coming to terms with with that. And my advice to you would be that give some thought to coming to terms with it yourself, because your death is coming too, and uh, you you may find yourself in my situation where you get some forewarning of it. It can also cap happen absolutely. Um, absolutely suddenly so give some thought to it because it is a guarantee it is coming for you so um, so there you go I didn't mean to end on um, such a sad note um, but but maybe it's maybe it's the right thing you know like yesterday's video ended on a really happy note and today's today's video is gonna end on, on a bit of a I won't say a sad note maybe I'd say a reflective note but this is life. Life is many, many uh, emotions wrapped up into, into a lifelong experience. And there is sadness, there is happiness, there is joy, there is laughter, um, and there is tragedy and, and sadness. And look, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll say to you what I, what I said to um, Josh Polg yesterday, which is that the sad times will occur and they're completely unavoidable. They're, they're coming for you. The sad times are gonna happen. So when you have the opportunities for joy or happiness or just to do something a bit exciting or to put some, put some love and kindness into someone else's life, 
um, as hopefully I did for, for Josh and, and a few of you yesterday, you need to go for it because the sad times are coming and you can't control those. So what you sometimes can control is the happy times because you can invent happy times. And when you get the opportunities to invent them like I did yesterday, you need to go for it. You need to go for it because you need to even, one thing you need to even it out, you need to even out the happy times and the sad times. The other thing is that life is a mixture of experiences and the sadness and the tragedy will take care of itself. You need to take care of the joy and the happiness. You, you need to take care of that. So get out there and do something wonderful, okay? And actually that's what I want to end on. And uh, yeah, you go out and um, you, you do something great. And as Sarah Pog would say, be kind, make good choices. I'll see you next time. Bye.